Otay Boy. I'm Tom Saviello. I have my special guest today, Liz. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Tom. You're so beautiful compared <laughs> to these two ugly old guys on the other side. And who are you? Uh, who? Huh? Huh? I Scott Landry. Scott. Uh, who are you? Are you a congressman? Pretty near. Okay, I just wanted to check. Pretty okay. But no, Scott, thanks for coming on. And Scott, as you know, is, sits as the chair of Fish and Wildlife Committee. So when I have you guys come in, I try to bring Scott in to be part of this conversation. So, so Liz, you chase bear all the time, right? Uh, sometimes, yeah. <laughs> you shoot them. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have, I have. So you're the fisheries biologist for this area, correct? Yes, in the Ranger Lakes region, yep. Wow, cool. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about Liz. You went to, I placed, we started this off when I came in and said, I almost went to Paul Smith. So you went to Paul Smith. I did. So I actually grew up in upstate New York, uh, not too far from Lake Ontario, right where the Salmon River dumps in. And I went to Paul Smith College for four years, got a bachelor's in fisheries and wildlife sciences. I concentrated in fisheries. And throughout college during the summer, I'd actually come up and intern with the state of Maine oh, here really? in the Rangeley region. So I worked with Forrest Bonney and Dave Bushy, one of the previous predecessors. Um, and then when I graduated, I was lucky enough to get a full-time job, and here I am. And I knew both of those. I know Forrest, and I knew uh, Bushy very well. He yeah. was a good guy, really good guy. Really yeah. understood his business and very helpful about a lot of stuff. So, you, so you've taken his place. I have, yep. Yeah, I'm very lucky to have gotten to work with both of them. Yeah. Uh, so... Tell me, do we have any fish in this area? Oh, there's a couple. Couple. There's a couple. A couple yeah. of suckers are here, or there. Or yeah, all. suckers, bullheads. Yeah. yeah. No, we're very lucky here in Western Maine. So let's let's start off with the native trout population because that's one that I remember in the, when I was in the legislature and on the uh, wildlife committee, we had defined some water bodies as a water bodies, which mm -hmm. means that the fish, the brook trout, produce themselves, never been stocked. And yeah. there were some that had never been stocked in 25 years, and then it became the rest of them. Mm -hmm. So how much of that population do we have in this, in this area or in the state of Maine? Uh, the Western Mountains is very fortunate. So that list, the AB list, has actually been combined into one list now. It's called the State Maine Heritage List. It includes brook trout and Arctic char, which we do have a couple here in this area. We'll come back to that. Yeah. One. And um, so, yeah, there's, there's a lot. There's probably close to 100 right in this Western Mountain area. Fish 100 fisheries. A hundred different ponds. Yep. Wow. So it doesn't include lakes and streams, just just ponds and lakes um, that have wild, self-sustaining populations that haven't been stocked ever or in 25 years. That's right, because I forget when I was in the legislature the first year, that's been 16, 18, almost 20 years ago. So those 25-year lakes have moved beyond that 25-year yeah. window. Chandler Woodcock was involved in developing that, mm -hmm. that uh, criteria way back. Um, and we had a big debate one time about Splake getting into the fisheries. And and but splake are well what are well let's go back to the neighborhood those are protected in the sense that you're fly fishing only in those ponds um so they're protected by you can't use bait in those waters um but not all of them are fly fishing only you know every water is managed a little differently whether it's fly fishing only or artificial lures only but it's uh it's fairly consistent that you can't use live bait because one of the biggest concerns with a wild brook trout fishery is getting an invasive fish species um, really to any native fish population is an invasive fish species and which isn't always necessarily a non-native to Maine um, it could be another native fish population or fish species but new to that water so kind of changing that dynamic is, is never good that's why we really encourage people um, you know never dump their bait never move fish around so and that's pretty much how bass got into the state of Maine if I understand it right, it was the railroads that brought bass up here from Massachusetts. Yeah, bass seem to be, they're, they're pretty, pretty popular in the state, throughout the state. Um, so. And they're not, people consider them a trash fish. Some people do, and then some people <laughs> really enjoy them. They certainly have a place um, in certain parts of the state, you know, southern Maine, they've created quite a fishery. And we have some populations here in western Maine, um, which have kind of, you know, they're here now, and people, some people have seemed to have accepted them and fished for them. Um, but still, we encourage people not to move them. You can't get rid of them, but please <laughs> don't move sure. them. So Arctic char, what is Arctic char? Is it a trout, or is it in the same species, or is it its own species? So yeah, Arctic char, uh, they're in the char family. So um, we're very fortunate in, in the state of Maine. There's just over 10 populations. Um, most of them are endemic, so they've been here since the glaciers. And they're landlocked. So when people think of Arctic char, they think of the Canadian one that runs to the ocean. So these ones are landlocked, so they spend their whole life in the lake. Um, and so in the Rangerly region, we actually have two populations. Really? Um, and one of them was a translocation. So in an effort back in the 70s to create new waters, um, new, more char waters, we tried moving them around to create additional populations just because there's so few of them. 
Uh, and one of them actually took a long pond and four ponds at height of the land. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but there's a, there's a landlocked Arctic char population there. But it came from Flood's Pond, which is which is down east. So. so did the Arctic char, in that case, when you reclaimed it, you killed everything in the pond and then put the char in, or did they? Get... Nope. So the pond um, only had brook trout in it at the time, and brook trout and char live very well together. They can't hybridize. Uh, they kind of use different different um, parts of the lake, so they they coexist well together. So they were just, you know, the adults were translocated into that water, um, and they took. But char need very specific um, water quality and food habits, so they don't always take. That's why there's so few in the state, and they don't do well with competing species, but they do live well with, with brook trout. So what would be a competing species for Arctic char? Uh, rainbow smell, lake trout um, would be two big ones. Um, and that's, you know, a lot of that just goes down to they're both kind of in, inhabiting the same area and eating the same food, or could be preying upon char themselves. Oh, wow. So is there a depth requirement for the Arctic char? So they really like cold, well-oxygenated water, so they need those waters with excellent water quality, which Maine has a lot of, but also we have a lot of other species in those lakes already, so that's why we don't have too many, so we really try to protect the ones we have. So the, the other big fisheries one that we have is splake. Yeah. So tell me about splake. Yeah, so they're a cross between uh, brook trout and togue. Um, they're a fast-growing fish. Um, they're a little longer than brook trout, so brook trout on average live to be about five years, where lake trout can live for many decades. So they're kind of a, they're a cross, they're in between. They can live longer than a brook trout, but they grow fast and large like lake trout. So anglers really like them. Not sure if you've ever fished on places like Mount Blue or Lafkin. It can be a fast fishery. They're very, they, you know, when the fish are biting, can be fast. So. What, what I've been told is since Mount Blue Pond, we talked about yep. uh, now a special place in my heart, uh, that they've just recently opened up to ice fishing. Yeah. And that the action on there with Splake is just unbelievable. Yeah. So opening day this past year, I was actually ice fishing on Mount Blue Pond. Oh, okay. Yes, yes. And um, I had set one trap out and I was about to set the second trap and I turned around and I already had a flag and had a Splake on. So. It can be very fast fishing, and anglers really enjoy that. Yeah, and then they say a lot of the kids really enjoy that because the action is phenomenal. Oh, yes, kids what, love it, and, and they're beautiful. You know, they look a lot like brook trout, which is, I think, yeah. you know, one of the prettiest fish in the state. So How do they eat? They eat very similar. You know, it all comes down to what they're eating. Yeah. Um, you know, if a fish is eating fish, I personally don't think they taste very good, but, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, and they will. They'll eat other fish, you know, but certainly they would eat, you know, insects or anything. They're, yeah pretty advantageous. And, and, and splake are, are they're, they don't reproduce, correct? Correct. Or they, or they don't think they reproduce. We've never documented it in the state of Maine, yeah. They're hybrid, right? Yeah. 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 So I, uh, I've, I've, I've looked forward to seeing splake. I think I've seen a couple bass at the pond, right at yeah. the shallow part, but it's yeah. sandy right there, so they're, they get probably getting ready to nest as best they can. Yep, it's coming up. It's that time of year. That was a good time to go bass fishing. Yeah, yeah, it's a gorgeous pond. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, well, not that I would say it was gorgeous. It's a terrible <laughs> pond. Nobody oh, yeah, don't go it. there. You don't want to go there. Well, it used to be the water supply for Phillips yeah, at one time. Yeah. So, and because of that, there's no motorized boat that's allowed yeah. on the pond. And uh, so you don't have to paddle around, which is, makes it a challenge for some people. Yeah. And then the only real public access is the old water power, water line. Yep. So, and I understand that's pretty mucky and muddy during some times of the year. So. Yeah, it can be, certainly, around mud season. So. Yeah, but I'm okay. I don't need to worry about that. <laughs> so what about... Uh, uh, landlocked salmon. We have a tremendous population in the mm -hmm. Rangeley area. Yeah, yeah, we're very fortunate. We have some uh, stock populations. You know, Rangeley Lake we stock with uh, with salmon. There's some wild salmon there as well. Um, but Wooslick, McGunnick Lake, and Aziska Haas Lake are all um, wild reproducing salmon populations. They're very abundant. Um, we actually have a regulation to kind of assist that because there's so many. And really the reason for that is um, the tributaries. There's two very big tributaries on both those lakes that provide such great spawning and nursery habitat. Um, and they're such big lakes with so much forage. They're, they're, just, they're just so abundant, which we encourage anglers to go out and harvest them. To take them because you want to yeah. keep the population in control. Yeah, we want to keep it healthy because um, there's also brook trout, um, native brook trout in those populations as well. And so obviously they're, you know, at times competing for food. So if salmon are overabundant and competing with, with trout, you know, we try to keep both of them. And Is the size of the salmon in those lakes? They're smaller. Where it should be there? So you yep. need to fish them harder, like yep. Sebago? Yep, yeah, they we try to encourage harvest. Um, so 
kind of in a sense there's more food per fish. Yeah. Um, whereas rangely, we stock. We actually pay pretty close attention. We're there every fall trap netting, looking at the spawning population. We investigate the smell population. Uh, we go out and we actually do um, kind of a smelt survey. We look at egg deposition in the spring. We go up and down the streams uh, every spring and we try to assess, was this a good smelt run, a bad smelt run? We saw a lot of wild fish this year. Was, and so then we actually, every year, we look at the stocking rate of Rangeley and try to adjust it just right because that lake in particular, we, we manage for a, a trophy salmon fishery. Yeah. So a lot of times when you see the bigger salmon come from the Rangeley area, they came from Rangeley Lake itself. Yeah. They used to is smelt fishing still pretty popular? Dipping is still pretty so popular? So most of it? the Rangeley Lake, the Rangeley Lake chain itself is closed to, right, to right. smelting. We save all the, the smelt for the forage, as forage for trout and salmon. Um, but there are places in the Rangeley area, like a Ziskahas, you can still smelt dip. Um, and it is popular, but it does seem to be something that's kind of fading with time. There's still the people who, you know, went out with their grandparents and really love it <laughs> and try to get their kids into it. Yeah. But it does seem to be kind of a fading activity. When I was young over in the Dexter area, <clears throat> we used to go over to Harmony Castle and Lake Wasakeg, and it was absolute insanity. Chaos, yeah. yes. Yeah, and I mean, the game wardens were hiding, and people were drunk and falling <laughs> in the Jeez. streams. And Party it, time. It, it was really a crazy Yeah, well, it's scene. a nighttime fishing activity, yeah. so it goes hand in hand. It, it, was, it, was, it was interesting. Yeah. So tell us, Liz, what's a typical day for you? So let's say, well, a typical week. You yeah. Know, other than the fact that you have to really go fishing, and that's really tough duty. It's horrible. I saw pictures of that. <laughs> it can, I'm all over. I do, I mean, I think that's one of the things a lot of people don't understand is we just, we kind of were jacks of all trades. You know, one day I could be helping the hatchery crew hiking up uh, Bigelow Mountain to the Horns Pond helping stock fry. And, you know, the next day I could be at Mount Blue Pond looking at access, you know, trying to secure access. I mean, Maine's very fortunate. We have great access to a lot of these waters, but, um, you know, everything's always changing. And so fishers and just work really hard um, to make sure we can secure and maintain that access to these waters for the public. Um, you know, we manage, uh, we manage all the stocking rates and regulations. So when you open the rule book, I should say this because I might get complaints, but, you know, you see the fishing regulations. And Our phone number yeah. is. Yeah. <laughs> so a lot of that we go out and we collect, you know, the fish and we take samples and we analyze the data and look at, you know, what's the use. And from there we, we propose new regulations, which can take, you know, several years for a new regulation to become effective. So that's very time consuming as well. Well, I found that when I was in the legislature, and it was interesting because I had groups that were very upset that they couldn't take more trout than they were allowed. Um, and I began to realize in my mind there were two types of fishermen, meat fishermen and trophy fishermen. Mm -hmm. Meat fishermen just wanted it to eat. Yep. They didn't care about how big it was. If they got a string of 15 small trout, that was breakfast yep. and dinner. I mean, that was great. And then most was, of them take the rest out. And then the, the other guy, the big guy, they wanted to catch them and release. And then there was the debate between the barnyard hackle group, which I'm a member of, and the fly fishermen. And, and it was really interesting. I'm, I, don't have, I don't know how you guys dealt with it, but sometimes I got the feeling there was an eliteness by the fly fishermen, unintended, but that's what they were looked at upon. Yeah, and I mean, that's, that's definitely one of the challenges is managing all these fisheries. So in the region that I work in, there's over 400 ponds and lakes and then, you know, thousands of miles of stream. There's a lot and there's a lot of different users, like you said, <laughs> and users have different opinions of, of what the water should be managed yeah. for. So balancing that, it takes a lot. Um, so, you know, we try to do a lot of public outreach. You know, it's not uncommon to see us out on the lakes uh, during ice fishing yeah. season, checking anglers and you know, at boat launches, checking anglers, so. Speaking of access, uh, McIntyre Pond, is it over uh, off the Roxy Rand Road in the yeah. Sharon? Are you familiar with that pond? Oh, yes, yes, that's one where we've been, we have our eyes on. Yeah, there's yeah. been some, and that's been taken over by the Belgrade Highlands, right? That's yeah. been transferred to the, that region. That property, yeah. around. That property. Yeah. Now, access, we had quite an issue for a while there. Mm -hmm. People trying to drive in because there was a road that was owned by a gentleman who I believe passed away. Yeah. To get to that pond, people can't use the road. I understand they have to walk through the woods. If they want a canoe, they have to lug it through the woods. Yeah, so the Great Pond Act, if it's over um, 10, oh, acres. Ten, 10 acres, then the public has access to it. However, they cannot use a road if it's posted um, or anything, you know, if it was a mowed lawn or something that's 
that's been, you know, improved. improved. So they could walk through the woods. Yeah. You can't be stopped from doing that to get to a great pond. Yeah. However, it's quite a quite a way to take a canoe. So a lot of people is, prefer yeah. to take, you know, a float tube. Yeah. So. Uh, but and, and that's you know that your point about that is that ten acres, the Great Ponds Act says that I can drag my canoe across your property. I cannot use anything that's improved. Right. And that you can, but you can't leave your boat on my property. Correct. You, like a lot of people like like at the Phillips. Uh, yeah, they like now, to leave. The, they leave their boats. Yeah. The whole line of boats there. You can't leave your boat on my property, but you can get to the shoreline. Like I have 600 feet, somebody can drag their boat across, launch there, but they can't use the road that I use or the path that I beat down to the shoreline because I've improved that. Um, and then it's 30. I, I didn't know this. We talked about this because an impoundment that's created by a dam, it's 30, 30 acres. acres. Yeah. yeah. So we had quite an argument with an individual who believed that somebody was. Uh, Restricting his use of this pond mm -hmm. uh, because it was twenty, but it was twenty nine acres. Yes, yeah. yes. So he had the ability to do that. But when you stock, you, does a stock pond have to have access, public access? Yes. Yes. Yep. So, so it has to be some way the public can get there. So, I, because I have one of these arguments way back when about Ma Day Mountain Pond, mm. is that somebody says it's stocked and there's no access, and I said it's more than ten acres. You have access, but it, does it have to be a public access or some? method they can get there besides drawing across the property? So we call it equitable access. So if the camp owners, you know, could put in a boat, but the public has to walk 10 miles in and use a float tube, that's not equitable. We wouldn't stock that. So it has to be equitable for everybody. These, these fish are public fish. It's a state water. It has to be equitable access for everybody, for us to stock it. So if I use Mount Blue Pond as an example, there's equitable access because yep. it's the Phillips, the old Phillips water yep. line way that people can bring their boats down and they can get in. Of course, there are only like two camps on the pond anyway, yeah. so it doesn't really matter. Yeah. But um, And it's no motor boats, so everyone's using the same. Same, same yep. kind of equipment that's on there. Yep. That's interesting. So the, and how do you decide what to put into a pond to stock it? And well, how do you decide the size that you're going to put into the pond? Well, a lot goes into it. Um, so usually, obviously, brook trout, if we're going to stock, is kind of our first go-to because Maine has such a robust population of, of brook trout. You know, that's our native fish species. Um, and so most of the waters at one point likely had brook trout if they don't have them now or we feel we need to supplement the Just population to, question, to, create, to help create a fishery and not put too much strain on the wild population. Um, so typically we stock brook trout. In the Rangeway region, we only stock brook trout, landlocked salmon, and splake. Um, so a lot of times we look at what's in the drainage, you know, and, and what's what's around that water. So typically we go with brook trout. A lot of times we go to wa we look at water quality. So with salmon, they need, you know, they need smelt. Does the water population does the population have smell? Is there uh, adequate water quality? Salmon need, you know, really good water quality, great dissolved oxygen. So brook trout, they're pretty versatile. They can live in, in pretty adverse habitats, places yeah. you'd be surprised they can live, yeah. um, and that's and we're pretty fortunate here in Maine. But as far as size, um, so there's different sizes. We could stock them as fry, which you know would be about yay big. And if we're doing that, there's not much in that pond because obviously as they're stocked as fry, they're very vulnerable to predation. So typically for stocking fry, there's not many of those waters. There's no thing else in that water except for trout. Would you reclaim a pond to put fry in? That has been done, yeah. yep. Um, and then the next size up would be fall fingerlings. We put those in the fall, have them hold over, and they'd be there in the spring for a fishery. And kind of same thing, um, we'd be looking for a water body that doesn't have a lot of competing species. Um, and then spring yearlings, you know, we stock those in the spring. We stock those for a lot of put-and-take fisheries, you know, near yeah. bridges, mm -hmm. ponds near roads. Um, they certainly can hold over for several years. Um, and then fall yearlings, you know, they can be up to 12, sometimes 14 inches, depending on which hatchery. Uh, and typically we put those in waters that are ice fishing, you know, we provide them for mm -hmm. the ice fishermen, but they do hold over as well. What's the normal growth rate in a healthy pond of a brook trout? It's so variable. Um, you know, it's, it's really hard to put a number on it. I mean, we have waters that a five-year-old brook trout could be eight inches, and then we have some ponds that a two-year-old brook trout could be eight inches. It really comes down to the water quality and the habitat that they have.
And you know you yeah. used to have a fish hatchery in Toothacker Pond. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that was an interesting debate many years ago. But that was a brute fish hatchery. They kept the big mamas there. And, yeah. And then they, they closed it down eventually. What about brown trout? Is brown trout stocked? or is, yeah. And can it become a native trout? I mean, I know I've been told in Mount Blue Pond there are brown trout. Do they, do they spawn in, in, in the pond? or are they we've, just... we've never documented brown trout sp spawning in Mount Blue Pond. We do stock a couple in there every few years, and we do the ice fishermen do catch them. <clears throat> brown trout can grow big, anglers like them. Uh, the key with brown trout is they're typically more active on those twilight hours, so like dusk and dawn. Um, but they can grow big. They're, they're originally from Europe. So the state does stock them. There's very few populations where they're, they're self-sustained now, but actually up in the, the Orbiton, Reddington streams, there are some wild browns there mm -hmm. in the stream. They don't get very big because they're stream dwelling, but in the lakes, um, in the Rangeley area, we have a few brown trout fisheries. Um, but we haven't documented any of them reproducing yeah, in the lakes. Yeah. It's a pretty good fishery and weld, I believe, of brown trout. Yep, yep, yep. people enjoy lake. that. Yeah. They, they, they need the, they can take a warmer temperature too, right? Yeah, Correct. yeah. Because I remember back when I was at the mill, uh, they wanted us to stock brown trout in the Androscoggin River. And I said, why are you going to want us to? But they absolutely insisted that we do this. So I, we did it. And we had to go down there and watch them all go in. And I watched them all go down the river. But we had to send somebody out every day. And when the anglers came off, we did a survey. Did yeah, you catch any yep. brown trout? No. <laughs> and so when I got to the second year of trying, I said, guys, they're just going down the river. No, you still got to put them in. So we put them back in again. At the third year, they told us to stop. Yeah. So, yeah, we do a lot of creel surveys. You do a lot do creel. Of, I was just going to ask you. Yeah, it's pretty, that's one of the, the big tools we have. We go out, one, it's a great way to interact with the anglers. Um, two, we figure out, you know, what are they catching? Are they keeping fish? And especially on stock fisheries, that's that's really important to know. Are people catching them? And, and then are they keeping them? So that helps us with, you know, how many fish to put in. If everyone's just releasing them, then... That's different than if everyone's walking off the lake or pond. So I'll tell you my fish story. Yeah. So I used to spend a lot of time up in the Telos area. That's oh, what I was working yeah. on my PhD project and so forth. <clears throat> and Ripagina Stream came right through through our, our plots. And so we would fish there. And we eventually found a, about a mile from the road this deep hole. The water would come in and it would turn left. It was really deep. And we could go there any day pretty much with barnyard hackles and get two or four, three or four trout out of it. So we were up there one night with a big meeting, and the people that were at the meeting fed us lobster. And one of the guys wanted to go fishing. And I said, well, you don't have a license, but I know a place that's a mile away. We'll go see if we can find it. But we had no bait other than old lobster claws that had been left. Nobody had eaten the meat out of them. Oh, my goodness. So I'd heard this rumor that <laughs> years ago my advisor said that we used to buy lobster because it used to sell for 39 cents a pound as fish bait. So I said, well, I'd heard this story. So we went back into the spot. We were there half an hour and caught 15 trout. You, the lobster didn't hit the water, but something grabbed them. They were all little six, eight inches. Boy, they were good breakfast trout. That's well, they've only. been eating lobster. Of course <laughs> they were yummy. Yeah, they yeah. didn't eat it very much. But <laughs> I tell you, I've sure. never seen anything like that. That What hit it, boom, they slapped that water. And came That's out. funny. And that yeah. was without a license? No, I had a license. <laughs> I had a license. Somebody else, I don't know whether he really fished or not. He may have just gone on the hike. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, no. what, so what's your favorite fishing story? Oh, my favorite fishing story? I have so many. I don't know. So I was really fortunate. I grew up, I, I spent a lot of time fishing growing up. My family, every time we went on vacation, we'd only go on vacation really to target a fish species. Really? Wow. So yeah, I've been fishing. I've been very lucky fishing all around. Um, all right. So let, I'll help you. What's the biggest fish you've caught? Uh, let's see. Well, I've been to Alaska, so, uh. so I've caught a kingfish, um, but I also grew up near Lake Ontario. And fish the salmon river. I mean, we, my brother and I, would get out of school and we'd just beg my dad, like, yeah. take us down to the river, take us down to the river. And so we'd be out there fishing um, for you know kings and cohos uh, coming up from Lake Ontario. So similar sizes to Alaska, really. But um, and then I loved to deep sea fish. Um, so obviously some pretty big fish in the ocean. Yeah. 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 Speaking of licenses. Uh, do your kids all have lifetime hunting and fishing they do. license? They do. That's something every child should be. They should. They should. Um, so uh, my parents actually, when, when my kids were born, before they turned five, bought all their lifetime licenses in the state of Maine. They're, yeah. they're still in New York. And they can't believe, they think it's the best deal. And they can't believe not everybody's doing that. So yeah. I buy them from my grandchildren. Yeah. I got them wonderful. because I'm old. 
<laughs> All right, it might cost $35, but now it's a lifetime license, so it's good yeah. to have that on hold. Yeah. So where would I go fishing? Where do you think I should go fishing in, in, uh, in, in Franklin County? In Franklin County? Well, if you have a, you know where your camp is, I mean, Mount Blue Bond's a great area, but, um, so I don't live too far from you. And so um, I really enjoy going up to Day Mountain Pond. That's a, that's a wild, self, self-sustaining population. That's a great fishery in the evening. Um, and then if I want to take the kids, I, I skip over to Schoolhouse Pond, which is a stocked fishery. Um, but um, the pictures you were referring to is on Pierce Pond. That's that's one of my favorite waters to fish. Um, Pierce Pond, so everybody knows on Facebook, she was working really hard I was <laughs> catching these trout that were about this big. And and Mark Lady was there, so there's a big smile on his face. He was probably doing public relations communications <laughs> with the fish. <laughs> Maybe. No, we were just fishing. Yeah. But no, no. Um, Really, there's so many wonderful places to fish. And, um, yeah, they, I mean, I'm happy to, to talk to any angler about places to fish. And, and that's, we, it's pretty frequent. It's, it's not every day, but almost every day I get a call or an email. Someone's in the area or wants to know more about a fishery or where could I go fishing. You know, I'm in Eustis for a wedding. Where should I go? And it's, it's pretty common. So, so for, well, you won't see this, but right now Andre would be running the phone number you give to him right <laughs> underneath here, so they know who to call. What about Flagstaff? What's in Flagstaff? Is it just bass, or is there, there shouldn't be any bass in there? Have you caught a bass? No, no, oh, okay. no. I'm just thinking it's shallow and warm. It is. So it's it's because it's an impoundment. Um, it's very shallow, um, warm. There's not not great oxygen, obviously. So it's really hard for trout and salmon there. But the old lake, the old Flagstaff lake. Yeah. Um, so we stock a few salmon in there, and, and people do catch them. Um, they really hold on to kind of that old Flagstaff pond. And then if you look at the old maps, you can see where the river yeah, goes yeah. through. Um, so so be deeper in that spot. Right. Um, and then a lot of the, the incoming, you know, the south branch and the north branch of the dead, those are stocked with brook trout. Um, and so Flagstaff Lake is just really hard because it's yeah. an impoundment, it's shallow, it doesn't have great water quality, yeah. so um, it has pickerel, it has pickerel and perch, that would probably be the biggest pickerel. fishery. That's probably the biggest fish <laughs> I ever caught was a pickerel about that long. Oh, yeah. And then the other famous one is Northern Pike. How, ba how bad is that in Franklin County as we get ready to end the show? Um, well, thankfully, we don't have, uh, we have only have one population and it came up, you know, from, from southern Maine, it's kind of creeping its way up, but certainly that is a concern and, and we hope to not get any more of Let's hope Northern Pike population. I mean, I've been up to Baker Lake up at uh, the St. John, and but where the uh, pi pike has come in from Canada and done mm -hmm. a pretty damaging thought to the population up there. Yeah, I remember when it was a shock when they stock, some anglers stocked moosehead with white perch. That was back when the 70s. Yeah, and an illegal stocking, and uh, people were quite upset. So Liz, we, uh, we this August maybe we'll come out and take us on a fishing trip. Or yeah. show us some of the things you do. Maybe we'll go to Mount Blue Pond and do some work there. That would be kind of fun. Yeah. I know where we can stay or I know where we can <laughs> sit and, and you can go out and fish. I don't because I'm right at that point where I think right off the my end of it's right by the fish landing, um, boat landing is uh, 38 feet deep. Wow. So yeah. I think that's right. So. But anyway, Liz, thank you. This yeah, is great. This is fantastic. Great. Thank you. Scotty, thanks for coming on the show. Always Appreciate it. Always a pleasure. Always uh, a next pleasure. week we'll have uh, the big boss coming on. Judy's coming on. Perfect. So we'll harass her. Well, I'm sure. glad I went before. I don't want to go after you her. You did great. <laughs> you did great. Um, so this is Tom Saviel for Talking Maine. Liz Thorntake, that was phenomenal. Thank you. And look forward to our little fishing visit this August sometime. Yeah, that'll be great. We'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in. That was great. Good yeah. job.